What is the golden rule and why do we say it's golden? Where did it come from? And if you find the golden rule in the scripture base of almost every major religion, how did it get there? Besides, if there's just one correct revelation of the pathway back to God, how did this common element seep into so many other worldviews? There's a lot of questions that need to be answered. But first of all, what is the golden rule and where do you find it? It's in that beautiful passage of scripture we call the Sermon on the Mount. The beginning of Jesus' ministry, he's laying the foundation for the teachings that we call the gospel. And the word gospel means good news. But almost everything he talked about in the Sermon on the Mount dealt with character issues. For instance, he started out, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that means a recognition of your need toward God. And then, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. These are really important character traits that need to be developed. But then on into the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, because he's moving the bar much higher, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Because even tax collectors do the same. Strange he would insert tax collectors. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Of course, the tax collectors worked for the Roman government and the Jewish people considered them traitors. And so they were not very well liked. And they're still not real well liked, are they? Therefore, he said, you shall be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. So he connected perfection to how you treat those who are far from perfection, those who have been your enemies, those who have expressed hate towards you. And then we arrive. The golden rule appears right after that. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus said, Therefore, and I love the word therefore when I find it in the Bible because it means a conclusion has been reached. And I've often said, when I see the word therefore, I want to find out what it's there for. And in this case, it's the summation of everything he said prior to that. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. In other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But he added the statement, this is the law and the prophets. Why? Because the Old Testament was primarily comprised of the law, which was the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the prophets were the major addition to the scripture base that they had under the Old Covenant era. And so, in essence, he's saying that you can sum up the importance of everything that was said in the law and in the prophets in this aphorism, this statement that whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. In other words, as you want to be treated, treat others. That's very similar to an aphorism or a maxim that James gave in his epistle in chapter 2, verse 8, he said, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The royal law. In other words, all other laws are subordinate to that royal law. And that is 
to treat others as you would want to be treated yourself. So the royal law and the golden rule are very much connected. Why do we call it the golden rule? Because gold is a very precious and valuable metal. Therefore, it is used as a symbol quite often for the precious things in life, the valuable things that we hold dear. Let me give you another good biblical example. For instance, Job went through that horrible trial where he lost all of his children and his kingdom was in a shambles because he was attacked by various marauding uh, invaders that came into his land. And he lost so much, his sheep, his oxen, etc. But then when everything just collapsed around him, he made this statement, when I come forth, he said, or when all of this is over, he said, I shall come forth as gold. In other words, he was saying, this is not going to destroy me. All of this devastation is going to serve the purpose of my character being refined. I'll become more loving, more compassionate, more trusting toward God. Even when things are not right, I'll still put my trust in him. That's what he said. Though God slay me, I will trust him. I shall come forth as gold. See, because gold speaks of that which is most excellent. And the golden rule Therefore, is one of the most excellent rules you can live by in life. One of the most valuable things that makes you valuable not only to yourself, but to other people. Now, is the golden rule found in the scripture base of most positive religious approaches in the world? Absolutely, yes. And I'd like to read to you, actually, I'd like to read to you out of the first chapter of my book, In Search of the True Light. And if you haven't purchased this book, you need to. It's a, a compilation of years and years of the study of comparative religions. And I guarantee, in fact, probably I could easily say decades of study in that particular area. And God spoke to my heart around the turn of the millennium to put it in a book form and write it in such a way that it would not only be instructive to Christians, but it would also be the perfect book to give someone who is a seeker who believes all religions are different paths to God. And in the first section of the book, I go into the common elements in all major religions. And one of the things I bring out is the golden rule. So I want to read to you from the scripture base of various religions. For instance, in the Baha'i religion, in Baha'u'llah's writings, he said, choose for thy neighbor that which thou choosest for thyself. In Buddhism, in the Udana Varga, chapter 5, verse 18, of course, they wouldn't call them chapters and verses, but for our sake, I'll say it that way, we who speak English. It says, hurt not others in ways that you would yourself find hurtful. And then in another passage of scripture from Buddhism, consider others as yourself. What about Confucianism? I like this one. Is there one maxim that ought to be acted upon throughout one's whole life? Surely it is the maxim of loving kindness. Do not unto others what you would not have them do unto you. So sometimes it's in the negative, sometimes in the positive. And that's from Analex chapter 15, verse 23. Well, what about Greek philosophy. In Aristotle's writings, treat your friends as you would want them to treat you. What about Isocrates? Do not do to others what you would not wish to suffer yourself. See, an echo through philosophy and religion so many times. Hinduism, men gifted with intelligence and purified souls should always treat others as they themselves wish to be treated. That's in the Mahabharata, chapter 13, and then 115, and verse 22. Islam. Not one of you is a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Jainism. A man should treat all creatures in the world as he himself would like to be treated. 
course, that widens to the animal kingdom as well, because uh, Jainists are, are very committed to vegetarianism. What about Judaism? Don't take vengeance on or bear a grudge against any of your people. Rather, love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's Leviticus 19.18. But then from the Babylonian Talmud, we have the statement, What is hateful to you, do not to your fellow man. This is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. I like that. Then in Sikhism, as thou deemest thyself, so deem others. Thou shalt then become a partner in heaven. Taoism, regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. Zoroastrianism, that nature alone is good, which refrains from doing unto another whatever is not good for itself. Do I need to supply any more proof? The golden rule, replicated in some manner, in some form, in religion after religion after religion after religion. Well, how did that happen? New Agers and Universalists and Pluralists will say because all religions are different paths to the same God. They are all legitimate approaches to achieve ultimate reality. But I don't believe that's how it got there. We have three options if we're going to explain how the golden rule is found in the scripture base of all world religions or all major world religions. There's three things we can come to a conclusion concerning. First, it's just pure coincidence. And I would dismiss that altogether. Second, some would insist that the prince of darkness, Satan, inserted that little tidbit of truth in the scripture base of all these other religions that Christians consider uh, to be a, a source of deception. And that is true. I believe the biblical approach is the only legitimate approach to the discovery of truth. However, some Christians say that Satan has deposited certain nuggets of truth in other religions in order to intensify the deception or another to make those belief systems more believable. That's not what I believe is the cause. Number three, the third option I believe is the right one that actually is the influence of God on the hearts and minds of men around the globe. You may say, well, how can that be, especially those that have never heard the gospel, those who have never heard the Bible preached, how could they receive the influence of God, the influence of the Holy Spirit? Let me explain. Let me first take you to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. That verse says, The Spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching out all the inner depths of his heart. Let me repeat it. The Spirit of the Lord or rather, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. That's talking about the spirit. But how many parts does a human being have? You are triune in nature. You are a trinity of trinities. You are made up of spirit and soul and body. And let me give you proof for that in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says... May the very God of peace sanctify you completely. And I pray to God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I said a moment ago that we are a trinity of trinities because each one of those three parts has three parts. The body is made up of flesh, bones, and blood. The soul is made up of mind, will, and emotions, and the spirit is made up of three functions, communion with God, revelation from God, and conscience. Conscience. Now, we are in a fallen state, and we are in a very dark world. In fact, prior to becoming a believer, you and I were referred to as children of darkness. Prior to accepting Jesus, who is the light of the world, into our hearts, 
The Bible even said you were darkness. You were so identified with darkness. You were darkness. You were in a fallen state. You were engulfed in the darkness of deception and delusion in this world. And you were in desperate need of the light of truth. Well, even in the old covenant, though, before the born-again experience was available, the spirit was still barely flickering. I like to compare it to a, a coal that is buried under the soil or under the sand where there used to be a, a fire. And somebody put out the fire and heaped sand or dirt on it and, and all the logs are, are just charred and, and show the effects of having been burned in the fire. But sometimes if you'll dig around in that campfire, you'll find a little coal that is barely glowing. And if you fan the flame, then it will jump up and things will start catching fire again. Well, that's the condition of the conscience in a normal human being is barely alive because the Bible said we are dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. That doesn't mean absolutely dead or we would have no inclination toward God whatsoever. But it means relatively speaking, compared to Adam and Eve in the beginning, we're dead and insensitive to the presence of God and the things of God until we are born again. And then when a person is born again, you receive a new spirit. And the Bible says your conscience is purged from dead works to serve the living God. But still, the conscience is barely alive in every human being around the globe. And because of that, God deals with human beings through the conscience when he cannot deal with them through the preaching of his word, the declaration or the teaching of his word. Maybe there's no one to influence them toward the truth, but subliminally, invisibly, God deals with every human being through the conscience. I know a long time before I heard the gospel, I began feeling smitten in my heart over the lifestyle I was leading. I was a rock musician. I had a near-death experience that shattered my world, and all of a sudden, I saw through the vanity and the futility of the way I was living, and my conscience started bothering me, and things I had indulged in before I wanted to recoil from in horror because I wanted my life to be clean and pure. I wanted to find truth. I wanted to find God, and that's when I turned to Eastern religions. Back in 1970, I became a student of an Indian guru, or actually uh, the latter part of 1969, and then the beginning of 1970, I began to embrace Kundalini Yoga and became very committed to it to the point where I became a teacher. And in all that time, I was striving for character. See, there's three functions of the Spirit. I want to emphasize again. Number one is communion with God. That's cut off from every human being because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Revelation from God, that's cut off primarily unless God decides to break through the veil. No one can decide they're going to experience supernatural realities that are true just because they have a decision they make that direction. But then conscience is the thing that still is functional to a certain degree in human beings. And Romans talks about that. Let me take you to the epistle to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 20. It talks about how all human beings have a little sensitivity to the existence of the Creator. And not only an ability, an innate ability to conceptualize the idea of a Creator, but it also carries with it a desire to know the Creator, to experience the Creator. That's something that is effected in every human being through the spirit that is in a nearly dead state, but it's still functioning to a certain limited degree. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead 
so that they are without excuse. So that verse says that the creation, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. How do you see God's invisible attributes? By looking at different aspects of the creation and seeing the nature of God reflected in created things. And that gives you an inward sense. He exists and I can know him and a desire to do so. But then it goes even deeper in the next chapter of Romans, verses 14 through 16. It says, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, in other words, they had no understanding of what God revealed in Old Testament times. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things contained in the law, they live moral lives. They strive for character. These having not the law are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness, while their conflicting thoughts will either accuse them or excuse them in the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Now, I went into a much deeper explanation of that passage in episode 17 of Revealing the True Light, where I talk about the conscience in much greater depth. So if you're interested, you should go to that. But the main thing that this verse conveys is that all men have this functional conscience. So let's go back to Proverbs 20, verse 27. It says, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. So the heart is engulfed in darkness. It's enveloped in darkness, but the spirit is like this little lamp inside of our innermost being that flashes light into our minds, into our thoughts, our emotions, our attitudes, our actions. It tells us this is wrong. This is right. Don't do this. You should do that. See, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. This is a very important point. So that's where you find commonalities in all religions. It's always in the area of character development. When you get into the higher levels of theology, like the nature of God, the true nature of salvation or liberation or enlightenment, different religions refer to a supernal, supernatural, spiritual state that is higher than normal, different ways. The Bible refers to it as salvation. Buddhism refers to it as enlightenment. Hindus will refer to it as oneness with Brahman or God consciousness. There's different ways of referring to the ultimate goal and, of course, different ways of interpreting what that will be and what that will involve. But there's an inward desire to get out of the, the prison of this body and the first step, the fundamental step in all religions is character development. But then when you get into the true nature of God, the true nature of salvation, as I just said a few moments ago, when you get into the revelation of the nature of man spiritually, the nature of the universe, then religions take every imaginable different direction and there's no agreement and much, much contradiction. So people assume, because at this foundational level of character, there's so many commonalities, that all religions must be legitimate. No, it's because at the foundational level, God is dealing with everyone through the conscience and through a barely lit lamp of the Spirit that illuminates them inside enough to know there is a God and I need to get to him. One other scripture I need to bring out, and then I'm going to close, is something Jesus said in John chapter 16 when he was foretelling the coming of the Holy Spirit. He told his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And the Helper is 
a reference to the Holy Spirit. The original Greek word is parakletos. That means one who comes by you, to stand by you, to uphold you, to defend you, to assist you, to help you, to counsel you, to comfort you. There's so many various ways you can interpret the meaning of parakletos. But in this particular version, the New King James Version, Jesus says, the helper will come to you. And when he has come, listen closely now, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. In other words, you won't have the example of a perfect human being in front of you to model your life after anymore. So you'll have to have this internal conviction that the Holy Spirit will bring into your life. And then finally, he will convict the world of righteousness, of judgment, rather, because the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, is judge. He will convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. When the helper is come, he'll bring conviction. Conviction is another word for the soul-gripping feeling that happens when your conscience is quickened by God. And so when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit into the world. And I believe it opened the floodgates in a good sense of the influence of the Spirit of God globally so that people who had not even heard the gospel would come under this influence spiritually that would make them turn toward righteous standards in their life, which includes the golden rule to love others and to do for others, even as you would have them do for you and even as you would have them love you or express love towards you. The royal law is a law that every human being knows intuitively. It's right and it's the way we should live. That doesn't mean because it's found in the scripture base of all these other world religions, it doesn't mean that we should inspect the scriptures of Hinduism or Buddhism or other religions in order to find the truth. It just means truth from the Bible and from the teachings inspired by God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that truth has filtered through into other religions. Now, it's our job to woo others to the Lord of love himself, who promised when we receive him into our hearts that he will fill us with love. He even prayed that love would be deposited in the hearts of his disciples in John chapter 17. So come to Jesus and let him birth in you an even greater capacity for love and for fulfilling the golden rule in your life.